you're known for being a great collaborator. So what is the right way to approach solving a difficult problem in mathematics when you're collaborating? Are you doing a divide and conquer type of thing or are you brain are you focused on a particular part and you're brainstorming? There's always a brainstorming process first. Yeah, so math research projects sort of by their nature when you start you don't really know how to do the problem. Um, it's not like an engineering project where somehow the theory has been established for decades and it's, its implementation is the main difficulty. You have to figure out even what is the right path. Uh, so, so this is what I said about, about cheating first. You know, um, It's like, um, to go back to the bridge building analogy, you know, so first assume you have an infinite budget and, and like unlimited amounts of, of, of workforce and so forth. Now can you can you build this bridge? Okay, okay. Now have an infinite budget but only finite workforce. All right, now can you do that and so forth. Um, so, uh, I mean, of course, you know, no, no engineer can actually do this because like, they, they have fixed requirements. Yes, yeah, so there's this sort of jam sessions always at the beginning where you try all kinds of crazy things and you you, you make all these assumptions that are unrealistic, but you plan to fix later. Um, and you try to see if there's even some skeleton of an approach that might work. Um, and then hopefully that breaks up the problem into smaller sub-problems, which you don't know how to do, but then you fo uh, you focus on, on, on the sub-ones. Uh, and sometimes different collaborators are better at, at working on, on certain things. Um, so one of my theorems I'm known for is a theorem of Ben Green, which is now called the Green Tau Theorem. Um, it's a statement that the primes contain arithmetic progressions of any length. So it was a modification of this theorem of already. And the way we collaborated was that Ben had already proven a similar result for progressions of length three. Um, he showed that sets like the primes contain lots and lots of progressions of length three, um, even and even um, subsets of the primes, certain subsets do. Um, but his techniques only worked for um, for length three progressions. They didn't work for longer progressions. Um, but I had these techniques coming from ergodic theory, which is something that I had been playing with and, and uh, I knew better than Ben at the time. Um, and so um, if I could justify certain randomness properties of set, some set relating to the primes, like there's, there's a certain technical condition which if I could have it, if, if Ben could supply me that this fact, I could give, I could conclude the theorem. But I, what I asked was a really difficult question in number theory, which um, he said, no, there's no way we can prove this. Can you, so he said, can you prove your part of the theorem using a weaker hypothesis that I have a chance to prove it. And he proposed something which he could prove, but it was too weak for me. Uh, I, I can't <laughs> yeah. use this. Um, so there's this, there was this conversation going back and forth. Um, it's sort of a Different hack. cheats too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to cheat more, he wants to cheat less. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but eventually we found a, 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 a property which A, he could prove, uh, and B, I could use. Um, and then we, we could prove our theorem. Uh, and um, yeah, so there's, there's a... All kinds of dynamics, you know. I mean, it's, it's, it's every every um, collaboration has a, has a, has some story. No two are the same. And then on, on the flip side of that, like you mentioned, with lean programming, mm. now that's a, almost like a different story because you can do, you can create. I think you've mentioned a kind of a blueprint, mm -hmm. right, for a problem, and then you can really do a divide and conquer yeah. with lean where you're working on separate parts, right, and they're using the computer system proof checker essentially yeah. to make sure that everything is correct along the yeah. way. Yeah, so it makes everything compatible and uh, yeah, and, and trustable. Um, yeah, so currently only a few mathematical projects can be cut up in this way. At the current state of the art, most of the lean activity is on formalizing proofs that have already been proven by humans. Mm -hmm. A math paper basically is a, boop, a blueprint in a sense. It, it is taking a, a difficult statement like big theorem and breaking it up into a hundred little lemmas. Um, but often not all written with enough detail that each one can be sort of directly formalized. A blueprint is like a really pedantically written version of a paper where every step is explained as as much detail as as, as possible, and to try to make each step kind of self-contained, um, and or depending on only a very specific number of, of previous statements that have been proven, so that each node of this blueprint graph that gets generated can be tackled independently of, of the others and you don't even need to know how the whole thing works um so it's like a modern supply chain you know like mm -hmm. if you want to create an iphone or, or some other complicated object um no one person can can build up um, a single object but you can have specialists who, who just if they're given some widgets from some other company they can combine them together to form a slightly bigger widget i think that's a really exciting possibility because you can have if you can find problems that could be Right. Uh, broken down this way, then you can have, you know, thousands of contributors, right? Yes, to be yes, completely yes, distributed. Yeah. So I told you before about the split between theoretical and experimental mathematics. And right now, 
most mathematics is theoretical, and when you're tiny bit, it's experimental. I think the platform that Lean and, and other software tools, uh, so um, GitHub and things like that, um, allow uh, they will allow ex experimental mathematics to be to scale up um, to a much greater degree than we can do now. So, right now, if you want to um, um, do any mathematical exploration uh, of some mathematical p pattern or something, you need some code to write out the pattern. And I mean, sometimes there are some computer algebra packages that can help, but often it's just one mathematician coding lots and lots of Python or whatever. And because coding is such an error prone activity, it's not practical to allow other people to collaborate with you on writing modules for your code, because if one of the modules has a bug in it, the whole thing is un unreliable. Um, so it's these are uh, so you get these bespoke uh, spaghetti code that written by non not professional programmers but by mathematicians you know and they're clunky and 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 slow and um, and so because of that it's, it's it's hard to to really mass produce experimental results um, but um, yeah but I think with lean I mean so I'm already starting some projects where we are. Not just experimenting with data, but experimenting with proofs. So I have this project called the Equational Theories Project. Basically, we generated about 22 million little problems in abstract algebra. Maybe I should back up and, and tell you what, what the project is. Okay, so abstract algebra studies operations like multiplication and addition and their abstract properties. Okay, so multiplication, for example, is commutative. X times Y is always Y times X, at least for numbers. Um, and it's also associative. X times Y times Z is the same as X times Y times Z. Um, so, um, these operations obey some laws and they, 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 they don't obey others. For example, x times x is not always equal to x. So that law is not always true. So given any any operation, it obeys some laws and not others. Um, and so we generated about 4,000 of these possible laws of algebra that certain operations can satisfy. And our question is, which laws imply which other ones? Um, so for example, does commutativity imply associativity? And the answer is no, because it turns out you can describe an operation which obeys the commutative law but doesn't obey the associative law. So by producing an example, you can you can show that commutativity does not imply associativity. But some other laws do imply other laws by substitution and so forth. Uh, and you can write down some, some algebraic proof. So we look at all the pairs between these 4,000 laws and there's about 20, 22 million of these pairs. And for each pair, we ask, does this law imply this law? Um, or if so, give a give uh, give a proof. If not, give a counterexample. Mm -hmm. um, so, twenty-two million problems, each one of which you could give to a, like an, an undergraduate algebra student, and they had a decent chance of solving the problem. Although there are a few, at least twenty-two million, there are like a hundred or so that are really quite hard. Okay, but a lot are easy. And the project was just to to work out to determine the entire graph, like like which ones imply which other ones. That's an incredible project, by the way. Such a good idea, such a good test of the very thing we've been talking about at a scale that's remarkable. Yeah, so it, it would not have been feasible. You know, I mean, the state of the art in the literature was like you know 15 equations and sort of how they imply it. That's sort of at the limit of what a human with a pen and paper can do. So, so you need to scale it up. So you need to crowdsource, but you also need to trust all the, um, you know, like, I mean, no one person can check 22 million of mm -hmm. these proofs. Uh, you, you need it to be computerized. And so it only became possible with, with Lean. Um, we were hoping to use a lot of AI as well. Um, so the, the project is almost complete. Um, so of these 20 million, all but two have been settled. Um, wow. And, uh, well, actually, and of those two, uh, we have a pen and paper proof of the two, uh, and we, we're formalizing it. In fact, I was, uh, this morning I was working on, on finishing <laughs> it. Uh, um, so we're almost done on this. Um, it's, it's incredible. It's, it's, yeah, it, it's fantastic. How, how many people were able to get? Uh, about 50. Uh, which in mathematics is, is considered a huge number. It's a huge number. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. So we're going to have a paper of 50 authors uh, and a, a big appendix of who contributed what. Here's an interesting question, not to maybe speak even more generally about it. When you have this pool of people, is there a way to uh, organize the contributions by level of expertise of the people, of the contributors? Now, okay. Uh, I'm asking you a lot of pothead questions here, but I, I'm imagining a bunch of humans and maybe in the future some AIs. Yeah. Can there be like an ELO rating type of situation where <laughs> like a gamification of this? The beauty of, of these lean projects is, is that automatically you get all this data. You know? So like, like everything's to be uploaded to this GitHub and GitHub tracks who contributed what. Um, so you could generate statistics from at any at any later point in time, you can say, "Oh, this person contributed this many this many lines of code, or whatever." Mm -hmm. I mean, these are very crude metrics. Um, I would I would definitely not want this to become like you know part of your tenure review or something. Uh, um, but um, I mean, I think already in 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 enterprise computing, right? People do use some of these metrics 
as part of, of the assessment of, of uh, performance of, a, of an employee. Um, again, this is a direction which is a bit scary for academics to go down. We, we, we don't like metrics so much. And yet, academics use metrics. They just use old ones. Number of papers. Yeah, yeah it's true. It's true that, yeah, I mean. Um, it feels like this is a metric while flawed is is going in the more in the right direction right yeah it's, it's an interesting I, I mean, at least it's a very interesting metric yeah i think it's interesting to study i mean i think you can, you can do studies of, of, of whether these are better predictors um there's this problem called good hearts law if a statistic is actually used to incentivize performance it becomes gamed um and then it is no longer a useful measure oh humans always <laughs> yeah yeah no i mean it's, 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 it's rational sentence. so what we've done for this project is is self-report so um, there are actually these standard categories um, from the sciences of what types of contributions people give. So there's this uh, concept and validation and resources and, 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 and coding and, and so forth. Um, so we, 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 there's a standard list of 12 or so categories. Um, and we just ask each contributor to, there's a big matrix of all, the, of all the authors and all the categories just to tick the boxes where they think that they contributed. Um, and just give a rough idea, you know, like, oh, so you did some coding and, and, uh, and you provided some compute, but you didn't do any of the pen and paper verification or whatever. And I think that that works out. Traditionally, mathematicians just order alphabetically by surname. So we don't have this tradition as in the sciences of, you know, lead author and second author and so forth, like, which we're proud of. You know, we make all the authors equal status, but it doesn't quite scale to this size. So a decade ago, I was involved in these things called polymath projects. It was the crowdsourcing mathematics, but without the lean component. So it was limited by, you needed a human moderator to actually check that all the contributions coming in were actually valid. And, and this was a huge bottleneck, actually. Um, but still, we had projects that were, you know, 10 authors or so. But we had decided at the time um, not to try to decide who did what, um, but to have a single pseudonym. Uh, so we created this fictional character called DHJ Polymath. In the spirit of Bourbaki, Bourbaki is, is the, the pseudonym for uh, a famous uh, group of mathematicians in the 20th century. But um, And so the paper was authored on the pseudonym, so none of us got the author credit. Um, this actually turned out to be not so great for a couple of reasons. Uh, so, so one is that if you actually wanted to be considered for tenure or whatever, you could not use this paper in your uh, uh, as you submitted as your, one of your publications because it was you didn't have the formal author credit. Um, um, but the other thing that we've recognized until much later is that when people referred to these projects, they naturally referred to the most famous person who was involved in the project. Oh, yeah, so this was Tim Gower's point of project. Or mm -hmm. This was Terence Tao's point of project. And not mention the, the other 19 or whatever people that were involved. Ah, uh, yeah. So we're trying something different this time around where we have everyone's an author, um, but we will have an, an appendix with this matrix. And we'll see how that well, works. I mean, uh, so both pro projects are incredible. Just the fact that you're involved in such huge collaborations. But I think I saw a talk from Kevin Buzzard about uh, the lean programming language just a few years ago, and he was saying that uh, this might be the future of mathematics. And so it's also exciting that you're embracing uh, one of the greatest mathematicians in, in the world, embracing this what seems like the paving of the future of mathematics. 